Welcome to In Her Voice. My name is Kelly Covert, and I am passionate about helping women live authentically by listening to their inner voice. Get ready to be inspired by women of all walks of life that have set aside their should be's and not good enough's and are standing in their true voice, the voice of wisdom that each and every one of us has inside. Welcome to episode number two of In Her Voice with Kelly Covert. I'm so excited to have our very first interview today with Laura Thompson Brady. She is a PhD and the founder of The Nourished Home. She's a master coach, a spiritual guide, and a sound healer who helps women awaken to their leadership and creative callings so they can bring more harmony and healing to their families, communities, and the larger world we call home. You guys are going to love this interview. We really dig deep into what she calls coming home to your own voice. And when I was first just starting to have an inkling of the idea of what this podcast would be about, I was reaching out to friends, asking them if they knew people with stories that would resonate. And this was someone who was mentioned to me. And once we did the interview, I knew it had to be our very first interview because Laura truly embodies inside and out a woman who is listening to her voice and who is using her voice and she uses her voice in the most amazing way. So sit back, relax, definitely take some notes if you need to. You guys are going to love connecting with Laura Thompson Brady. Laura, welcome to the In Her Voice podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you, Kelly. I'm thrilled to be here. Yes, I and I I just I've been reading up on your website about you and about your story and I'm so excited to just dive right in. And I want to start in maybe kind of an unusual spot because um this is something that caught my eye as being so seemingly different from mm-hmm. what you do as a coach. And that is an opera singer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we start there? Sure. So the kind of connection between who, who, you know, my background with that and and how it's kind of woven into my life now is that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. because I, I I don't think it's an accident that you're doing what you're doing, but it seems like a far journey from being an opera singer. So I, when I graduated from high school, I went into conservatory and and studied opera. And, you know, so that feels like many, many, many moons ago now, Uh, you know, with uh, life as a, as a mama of two girls and, uh, you know, having been in this field of, of, of the healing profession for so long now as well. But, but what I can say is that I always from, my gosh, I would say from the moment I could speak, I was singing. (laughs) Probably before I was speaking, I was singing. And that this call to use my voice in multiple forms, I will say, which probably is going to weave its way into this conversation too, but the call to really express my voice and and specifically my singing voice has been with me uh, as long as I can remember. And I think it begins really with the felt experience in my body and in my entire being that when I sing, my entire soul opens up. And it, it feels like the probably truest and most courageous and pure expression that I'm able to share with the world. And so, of course, that took the form, you know, as a, as a kid in school of, of performance, <laughs> you know, and, mm-hmm. and singing in multiple venues, multiple styles, you know, from musical theater to a rock band in high school and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and a teacher encouraged me to audition uh, for conservatory. I really didn't have a background in classical music and I got in. And so I just felt like if I don't really follow this and see 
how it feels and where it takes me, I will always wonder, you know? Um, so I started studying opera and uh, learned so much about my voice and about, uh, as well as about really being visible and seen, you know, in, in it's through the, through the platform of, of performance. And what I also learned uh, about myself through that experience was a very <laughs> powerful, relationship I had with fear mm. around being seen around <laughs> being visible and feeling feeling unsafe and exposed uh, to the point where I uh, after a few years I, I studied opera and then I ended up leaving that program actually and getting my degree in literature but I was performing in multiple ways and singing and songwriting a lot in my very early 20s and then something within me uh, really just felt so much fear, uh, really just around, I didn't like the way I felt so naked and so visible <laughs> that I kind of put it on the back burner and put that part of myself to rest for a lot of years, other than singing, you know, for family and friends, like oftentimes when somebody would ask me to sing at their wedding or, you know, I would sing at uh, funerals for people I loved who had passed away. Um, and other than that, there was a good chunk of years where I really wasn't allowing myself to be seen and heard uh, with this part of me that is so fundamental to who I am. And anybody who's called to, to be a musician, right, or a singer, uh, you know, or a performer of any kind, what we know is that it's not something that is not meant to be shared. It is meant to be shared. <laughs> yeah, you know, music is a sacred way of coming together uh, in community and in so many different forms throughout all of history. And so, this this experience of letting my fears really silence me to a certain extent for um, about a decade. Really, it was about a decade was, uh, very painful and it took a lot of energy actually to not <laughs> let it out. It took a mm -hmm. lot of energy to contain it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I, I want to, before you go on and we're going to get, we're going to keep going, trust me. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I want to talk, I want to say something and, and a question. What I heard you say was that your inner voice, your soul was expressed through your singing. Mm -hmm. And I think that for many people, the thought of that is incomprehensible. I think so many women just have a hard enough time hearing their inner voice, but to mm -hmm. know that it could come out of you mm -hmm. in that way, I think is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I think then what's so interesting is that when you gave into that fear, all of a sudden your outward connection to that inner voice went silent. Mm -hmm. it, it stopped connecting there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that that's so interesting that as a child it was effortless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then something shifted and that fear came in. What, what was that about? What was there there that made you feel like you needed to stop that? <sighs> Yeah. Well, it, so I think it's okay for us to go deep in these kinds of conversations when we're talking about our inner voices and the ways that we can be blocked from hearing them. I, I will definitely say that some trauma that I experienced in adolescence mm -hmm. and literally feeling safe uh, or being confronted with the feeling of not being safe in my femininity and in, um, in being a young woman, what definitely played a role. Mm -hmm. I also felt that there was something even bigger uh, beyond my own experiences in this life, beyond the trauma I had experienced in this life. Um, it, it felt almost like this tapping in to the collective consciousness of women. And, and this may sound a little crazy, but I'm okay with that. But, you know, connecting into this larger collective consciousness around women who really have used their voices on multiple platforms and put themselves out there, you know, throughout the larger context of history, that there have been plenty of times where it, it truly hasn't been safe <laughs> for women right. to be seen and heard. And, and that is still true for many women uh, around the world. Um, and 
so there was this, this deep level of fear of literally not being safe that I couldn't fully rationally explain. Um, but it was so strong. And I think I felt so afraid and even silly or shameful that the fear was there that it felt easier for some time to, to just put it away <laughs> and mm-hmm. to not deal with it. Um, so this, yeah, this fear arose, I would say through my own experiences and, and again, into something that felt bigger than that. And, uh, and what I will tell you is that there finally came a time, uh, an awakening, uh, and a connection into my inner wisdom and my inner knowing. And, and so therefore my inner voice where I recognized that, okay, well, say that, even though rationally speaking, my worst fear seems crazy and unlikely, (laughs) say that it's actually true, that maybe I wouldn't be safe if I really put myself out there with my voice in this bigger way. Well, what I was able to see finally was that the daily experience of not listening to my inner voice the daily experience of not allowing my soul to be expressed in the ways that were not only most life-giving to me, but also a gift to be shared in community, that that was like a slow, painful death (laughs) day by day that I was inflicting on myself. And I finally came to the realization that that slow, painful death, in my opinion, is far worse (laughs) than any risk I may be taking to use my voice. Yes. Be expressed. Yeah. So it was a true, uh, a true moment of, of awakening and recognizing that I can give myself the gift of listening deeply, not only to that inner voice, but also letting that voice be a presence in the world. Mm -hmm. And that, um, Hey man, being alive itself is a risk. (laughs) So (laughs) right. right? You woke up, uh Oh, you're in trouble. Right. You know, so if, so it really was that recognition, um, that, that gave me the, the courage to, to step back in, in so many different ways, uh, into a much fuller expression of my voice, including that, that voice that wants to sing. Mm, yeah. So when you talk about that daily experience of not being connected to your inner voice, of not letting that voice speak through you, mm. what, what did that feel like? I would say that it really led to a feeling of, uh, being a bit dead inside. Mm. It led to uh, feeling somewhat depressed. Um, It also felt, uh, it's that feeling that you're just kind of missing something. Yes. Yeah. That sometimes can't even quite name because we're so good. It's, it's, our, our minds are so brilliant and so complex and so beautiful. And they are really good at when we really bury something, we don't even fully, we can't consciously even name or pinpoint what it is we're missing. But it's this feeling of something is missing. And the other thing that I would say not listening to your inner voice leads to in that daily way. So for me, it definitely, I would say, showed up in the form of feeling like I had dimmed my light, you know, and feeling a bit depressed and, and all of that. Another piece that, uh, that I became very aware of was that when I'm not really present to my inner voice, I also can find myself moving at a harried pace. <laughs> I can find myself um, kind of, you know, just running around, taking on too much, um, taking on responsibilities that don't really feel aligned with where I'm called to show up, you know, and, and then also, uh, oh, that's when you're more reactive, you know, with your, your kids or your husband, that's when you have a shorter fuse. And ultimately, I think that when we aren't in tune with our inner voices, it, it really leads to an experience of being depleted and burnt out, you know, so Man, I think it shows up in all sorts of uh, you know little and big ways. So. Yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing.
saying that because I think that it's important for women to understand that these feelings, feeling like you're dimming your light, feeling like something is just missing, feeling crazy, like running around and exhausted and burnt out all the time, that is not what your normal has to be. Mm -hmm. And I think in these days, I feel like some, sometimes we wear it as a badge of honor. Oh, how are you, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm so busy. I'm crazed. Uh And that if we don't feel that way, that we're being lazy or we're not doing enough or what you should be doing something. And so I just, part of my mission with this podcast is for women to start understanding that that is not our birthright. (laughs) Mm. Our birthright is to feel peace and joy and love, to not be reactive with our kids and with our families, and to be sort of in this place of calmness mm-hmm. and fulfillment and of knowing that our lives are exactly where they're supposed to be. Yes. So yes. I just really appreciate you being vulnerable enough to share that with us because it's so nice to know that. Number one, you're not the only one who feels that way. And number Mm -hmm. two, you don't have to feel that way. Right, right. And a real wake up call for me around the harried pace part and the, yeah, being crazed and kind of who's even running the show of what I'm doing and why, you know, Um, a real wake up call for me was in having my first daughter, um, who's now 10. I can't even believe I'm like, I've been a mother for a decade. (laughs) (laughs) How did that Um, happen? How did this happen? But, uh, I had this, again, a real powerful switch went off where I just felt such radical clarity, not that I knew all of the hows, of course, but such radical clarity around my mission as Layla's mother. And, uh, and I really tuned in very quickly when she was a baby into noticing, okay, so what is the difference between what I think I should be doing, right? And now in this case, are like, what are other people doing as moms and what are the latest books saying and who do I think I should be as a mom? You know, what's the difference between that, which can really run the show for so many of us, right? To what is the truth of what feels right in my bones as a mother? What am I seeing and feeling and noticing is the pace and rhythm of life that is most nourishing and life-giving to us? What is the environment that I truly desire to create for this child that I'm bringing into the world? I don't want it to be rushed. I don't want us to be overscheduled. I don't want to be dictated by society's notions of, you know, like what good motherhood looks like. I want to tune in to what I'm literally seeing and experiencing in myself and in this child. And when the stakes were that high, when it was about, you know, this life that I had just brought into the world, it was a very powerful lesson uh, in, and really switching from the shoulds to what truly feels right when I'm listening deeply to myself and also noticing from a deep place of observation what my daughter truly needs, what supports her thriving, and what is the stuff that is just not necessary. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah. What a gift. I feel um, very similar that motherhood gave me the gift of knowing myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, whether or not you have children, there's always that one thing in your life that is an opportunity to know yourself. Mm -hmm. It's that moment where you're not sure if you're going to make it. And Mm -hmm. then you decide that knowing you and listening to that inner voice is so much more important and so much more meaningful than just staring around and looking at what everyone else is doing. Yeah. Yeah. Such a gift. So, so you took a break from singing from connecting with your inner voice for a decade, you said, what, what sort of got you back to that place? And then what happened? What did your inner voice tell you? Right. 
So, you know, what I will say is I think the inner voice shows up in, in a lot of different ways. So I wouldn't say that I wasn't connecting with my inner voice at all. <laughs> I was right. listening to a lot of, yeah, a lot of good threads, but it was, it was really that in that particular part, we have so many parts to who we are and that part of me that is the, the singer. Um, I really shut that part down because it felt safe at that time. What was clear and, and has been clear for me in a very conscious way since I was eight years old, when my dad was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma cancer and the journey that we went through as a family with that, what has been very clear to me through my entire life is the ways that I've been called to hold healing space Mm. for, uh, for myself and others. And, uh, so I was not feeling (laughs) really a lot of courage in the realm of being visible with my voice. What I was, I was led down the path of exploring, uh, uh, how can I start the work of deepening into how I might show up in the healing space? And it, it interestingly took the path of academia at first, actually, I started my graduate studies and, and doctoral research in human development and family studies. And really with a focus on uh, supporting people in understanding their core values, this was what my dissertation research ended up focusing on. I, I did work with Quaker families, actually, in the greater Philadelphia area. And I spoke deeply. I had deep conversations with parents and their young adolescent children and was interested looking at this particular culture within the United States that has a very strong position on nonviolence and how that was transmitted, how those values, those nonviolent values were transmitted and practiced between parents and children from the micro level of the home, you know, so conflict resolution in the home, how that was practiced in everyday life, all the way out into how they're showing up in community, um, even things like consumer choices, and then out even further into the kind of political scene. At that time, we were at war with Iraq. It was the post 9-11 climate at that time and was looking at, you know, how they were showing up in regard to supporting nonviolence during a, a particular time in history. And what I have ended up doing when I was in that, uh, process of doing that research, Layla actually (laughs) was born, Mm -hmm. um, And I recognized it was another kind of awakening, actually, Um, having kids. I really took some time where I focused in on, and this was a deep, deep inner voice moment of feeling really called to take a leave of absence. Um, I was just at the point of needing to analyze and write the dissertation. Everything else was done. So I was like, all right, I'm going to take a break from that and come back to it and uh, really be present with this child. That was what I felt deeply called to do. And uh, then we had our second daughter. <laughs> and, um, and from there, in, in the experience of being their mother, and also in the experience of connecting back into what are the ways that I feel called from that deep inner place to show up and make a contribution outside of motherhood? What does that really look like for me where do I think I can be most effective? Where do I think I can ultimately show up as a healer was what I came back to. And uh, so long story short, I ended up integrating my, my studies in human development and family studies. And I did take the time to you know finish my PhD, but I also uh, moved into the world of, of coaching. And uh, because I felt so clear that I want to be working directly with women and families and, and I want to be really working from a place of helping them see what is possible in their lives, helping them see how they can be rooted in their own core values, how they can live from that place of truly knowing themselves and letting again, a go of the shoulds, right. <laughs> letting go of uh, the script and really connecting into a deeper place of, of who they are as leaders from the private sphere of home um, to the public sphere of the work that we're doing in community. So it all kind of led me on the path to integrate all of this and, um, 
and it's been a really, really interesting journey with lots of ups and downs and certainly plenty moments of fear too, of continuing to listen to that inner voice and trusting <laughs> the depths of where it has wanted to take me with my work. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why, why do you think it's so scary I believe that when we listen and listen and listen some more to that inner voice, that it takes you through a journey of unfolding. And there's actually a lot of mystery when we're really listening to the inner voice, because the inner voice doesn't always tell us how to do it, whatever it may be. So I'll share the example of what brought me back to really incorporating my voice and even some of that opera training into the sound healing work that I do now. Uh, the more we listen to that inner voice, uh, the more it takes us down a path where we're receiving intuitive messages that maybe logically or linearly do not make a lot of sense to us. <laughs> yeah. And it takes such tremendous trust and a lot of continued leaps of faith. And it also, my experience and, and my experience in the work that I do with the, the women that I support as well is the more that we listen to that deep voice, the more it asks us to be in that space of courage and in that, in that space of really releasing those stories and the programming and the conditioning around who we thought we were, you know, who life told us we were, who society has told us we should be, maybe even, you know, in many cases, it's connected into our families of origin, um, you know, and, and who our parents maybe wanted us to be, all of those layers, the more that we listen to the inner voice, <laughs> the more we go down a path that is creative, um, often off the beaten path <laughs> and um, can feel like uncharted territory, can feel like you're kind of on the frontier. And that is scary. It is yeah. scary to, to, yeah. choose to go down that path. For sure. And I think that we carry so much weight of what other people will think of us. Yes. And, you know, what will, what will our parents say? What will, mm -hmm. you know, our loved ones say? What will my friends think if I do this crazy, seemingly crazy thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that we get into this cycle of being so concerned about that and so afraid of that, that like you say, we're choosing instead of to jump off the cliff and trust that there's going to be water below us to cradle us as we fall in, mm -hmm. that we're choosing the death by a thousand slow days. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh -huh. where where we just don't feel good and we're yeah. not joyful and we're not happy and we're not tuned in and we're not aligned with our soul's true calling. Yeah. So I have a question for you in regards to that trust. I think that a big part of that is obviously listening, like listening and doing and trusting, listening and doing and trusting. But I'm also curious as to what other practices you use on a daily basis that really help develop that trust more and more? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one practice that I've been using for, for years now and is so supportive of me really being in tune with myself is for me, it, it's around getting out into the natural world. We are so um, inundated with technology and everything moving very quickly. We are inundated with information, right? Through the media, social media, we're, we're just trying to consume so much all the time. And, and there are a lot of pressures in, in modern life. And what I certainly know to be true is that finding ways to regularly, uh, consistently, align with ourselves by being more aligned with nature, the natural world that we are just simply and inherently a part of is uh, not only very healing for everything, for your nervous system, for your energy body. It also is a simple yet profound tool to reconnect um, 
whenever you need to with that inner voice. So for me, one of the practices is there are these beautiful woods and beautiful paths that I love to walk on through the woods near my home. And, uh, it's pretty simple. (laughs) I go in and, you know, start my walk in the woods with the intention of, uh, especially if it's a day where it has felt busier, I have a lot of cluttered thoughts going on of just with every step. It's, it's the walk itself is a meditation of just letting, those, those thoughts melt away, letting my worries melt away. And, and it really comes through inviting all of my senses to absorb the, what I'm seeing, smelling, hearing, you know, feeling on my skin as I walk through the woods. So I'm noticing the way, um, the earth sounds under my feet. I'm noticing the, the sound of the, uh, wind, you know, rustling the leaves. I am feeling if it's a sunny day, the, uh, you know, the warmth of the sun coming down on my skin, I am noticing the smell of the earth, of the trees around me. And, and when I just allow my myself to be in the presence of, of my senses doing the job of, of absorbing that natural landscape and moving my body through it, um, it brings me pretty quickly, especially because this is something I do so regularly, into a real state of calm, quiet receiving. Mm. And... So the intention for me with with those meditative hikes, it's not necessarily to walk away with like a brilliant idea that I need for like my next blog post or um, it's really it's about connecting in with myself. And so sometimes it's very simple and just comes to a place of stillness and kind of almost feeling blank and, and just listening to the sound of the water in the stream, you know, and just w- like sitting on a rock and watching that, you know, I'll take a pause and do that. And other times it is a, an opportunity to really, um, just let my mind work through whatever needs to be worked through. And what I will say is that that spaciousness in that natural setting, um, what often does result from that is that not only is my whole nervous system in a state of calm, not only am I in a place of receiving and in a place of flow within myself, so inevitably I'm hearing and connecting in with my inner voice in a very calm, grounded way, But the other cool benefit is that I do end up leaving the woods or um, within a few hours, like really brilliant ideas and creative energy just flows through me with much greater ease than it does when I'm trying to just sit in front of my computer um, and and just move through the to-do list. Yeah. Well, and I think it's important to point out that this idea of you set your intention and what you aren't setting are expectations. That's right. No attachment. And I think that so often we come into these practices, like I'm going to journal today and find all of the answers. Right. And, <laughs> and I think then we're disappointed when we don't. And, and mm-hmm. instead we've missed out on the most important part of that. And that is just being still mm-hmm. and inside of you at that moment. And really mm-hmm. unattaching to the outcome, not having expectations of, of what's going to be coming. Right. Right. Yes. 100%. So you, you talked about how the, one of the scary things about our inner voice is she doesn't always tell us how. Right. She doesn't show us the how. And yeah. so how do we get to the how? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Well, <laughs> uh, I, so here's what I believe and what I practice. And I do think I have a, a pretty fun and funky story about what led me to the sound healing component of my work. Um, cause the, the how was so completely unclear when I first had, it wasn't just my inner voice. I quite literally had a vision of myself surrounded by all of these whitish glass bowls. I had no idea what they were. Um, And I was singing. I was playing these bowls and singing with them. And the vision was so, so strong. Um, This was in November 2015. 
the vision was so strong and so potent and so clear, but I had no idea what I was seeing other than the fact that it was like, yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> and it was this feeling that felt so beautiful and so um, like, this is, this is what I'm meant to be. I'm this, I, it was just so strong and, but I literally didn't know what they were. And uh, so I, I would say one thing in terms of the how, I mean, I'll just use this, you know, kind of crazy story as, as an example of this is we might see a vision or hear a message in our voices. And again, it's like, well, it, sometimes it may just be like a one word, <laughs> but it's really strong. Sometimes it may be an image. Sometimes it may be a feeling that we're like, I need to follow this, but, but right. The how we don't know. One thing that I would encourage you to do is to allow yourself to be uh, surrounded by supportive people who, you know, want the very best for you. So listening to your inner voice is fundamental. It's kind of the foundation for everything. And at the same time, although one's awakening can only happen within, I also believe that to really initiate ourselves into the awakening, I also believe that we can't do it alone. So uh, allowing myself to be vulnerable and say, I don't even know what I'm seeing, but it's so such a yes for me. Um, can you, pe like, you know, my trusted friends, can you like, do you know what, like, what are these bulls? What even are they? You know? And so again, for whatever it may be, that's arising where the how is completely unclear or the idea may maybe sounds crazy or like, you know, you're just like, uh, that this seems impossible or whatever the doubts are that are rising. Surround yourself with community. Um, and, and for me, uh, there are so many women in particular, that I have really allowed myself to be vulnerable with and to be supported by, and that I know we are all in the vibration of doing what we can to bring out the very best in each other. <laughs> so I have those people that you can go to with your crazy ideas or this message you've received from your inner voice and let them help you make sense of it. And so, you know, so just by asking the question, um, it was a friend in Rhode Island who was like, I think you're talking about crystal chakra bowls. And she's like, I actually have one. She started playing her heart bowl. She had the, the bowl that's aligned with the heart chakra and she played it for me over the phone. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And I looked them up online. They're beautiful. But I was like, I've never even been in the room with one of these before. I don't know where to find them locally. And I'm not going to buy this online. You know, like I, I've <laughs> never even heard somebody else play it other than my friend who just did it over the phone. And so then from there, though, another thing that I would say is there are times where um, by allowing yourself to receive not only the messages of your own inner wisdom, but also receive support around them and to not kind of be on an island by yourself with it, it's going to give the impetus to move forward. Sometimes that, that moving forward may come together very quickly. I would say, though, that a really important thing as well to accept when it comes to really listening to the call of your inner voice is that there are times where it's okay and important, critical, I would even say, to be in the season of winter, in the season of darkness, in the season of mystery, of, of not knowing, <laughs> and to be at peace with that, to be at peace with the phase and the cycle of discovery. Because when the inner voice is bringing something about that is so deep and so profound and a big leap, um, and the hows are not clear, we can sometimes try to rush through that important part of really hearing um, and knowing when you're ready to move forward. And so for me in this case, I it, that was November 2015, uh, winter passed, and it was in April and that I actually found the bowls in person. And again, it was a feeling of being deeply led. And I will say I've been doing a lot of work, Kelly, with that inner voice stuff for many years now. So the the levels I would say that you can go with this in terms of really intuitively hearing things, it can go very deep and which is really exciting and really magical. Um, but I went to this little store in my, in my, uh, local area, uh, to get a, a couple of uh, things for a retreat that I was hosting in a few days. I had a, a few days before I was going to be hosting this retreat 
And uh, I was checking out, I was at the counter checking out, I had gotten some candles and a smudge stick, I was at this kind of metaphysical store. And um, this voice in my head said, look up, Laura, <laughs> look up. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I look up and behind me on this high shelf right up against the ceiling uh, were all of these whitish glass bowls. Oh my and, and I'm like, hold on here. I'm like, wait, I don't know if I'm ready to leave. Are these those bowls? <laughs> and the man at the counter was like, yeah, those are those crystal chakra bowls. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um and I said, I would really love to get my hands on one of these. And uh, I, I asked for the, vo- uh, the throat chakra, funnily enough, throat chakra, right? Perfect. <laughs> I said, could I try that one first? And um, so, so you I, didn't I, even know what it was? You didn't know which chakra it was? You just pointed to it? No, no. I said, no, I said, oh, no, okay. I said to him, I said, I would love to, uh, he, he, what he said to me, he goes, this is kind of a thing. You got to find which bowl is right for you first. And, um, so I was tuning in not only to myself, but also to the, to the women that I was going to be hosting at this retreat and the theme of the retreat, a lot of it was around connecting in to your voice. And so I was like, well, let's definitely start with the throat chakra. So he puts this bowl in my hand and I start playing it with the suede mallet that he gave me. And this radiant, energy, this incredible warm energy, like, like the sun was just showering down upon me, enveloped my entire body. And I had tears in my eyes just about instantly. (laughs) And he was like, I think you found your instrument. And I ended up leaving that day with the throat and the root chakra and talk about listening to one's intuition and also not rushing the process because what was so again, magical and beautiful and bringing together, um, even in our little, uh, conversation here, Kelly, the, the opera singer, the sing, you know, the singer, that part of me. So I, you know, in my quiet ways have used music and song and have written things over the years that just haven't been shared. And, uh, I brought the bowls home and on the ride home, my voice said to me, that inner voice was like, Oh, right. This thing that you wrote that, that is called I am home. That is the invocation that you start the circle with. <gasps> um, and so I was like, root chakra bowl. That is the root chakra bowl. So I brought it home and I sat my husband and my girls down um, in the middle of the living room floor. I'm like, okay, you're going to be my guinea pigs here for a second. I just start playing the root chakra bowl and that I am home invocation so beautifully and immediately without needing to try or push or force was like married to the root chakra bowl. Wow. <laughs> and, and then all of these things are like, Oh yes, that, that, that they just clicked into place. And I literally brought the bowls with me to the retreat I was hosting four days later and they were integral to the work. And that was the beginning of me and sound healing and bringing my voice and, and the container and the vibration that these bowls hold um, into my work. And it feels like the deepest work yet that I have been able to share. I'm, I'm not kidding. If you could see my arm right now, you would see my hair is like standing on end. Like, that, <laughs> like that's just so cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is a little crazy, but it's really magical. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And I think I love, I love what you're saying about this idea of patience of not feeling like you have to rush it. Because I think sometimes maybe what happens is when we finally are at that place where we're connecting with the inner voice and we're trusting it, we're like, this feels so amazing. Now I got to go. And just to be patient and to still be in that place of quiet flow Mm -hmm. and being present and unattached to outcome and unattached to expectation, I think that that really changes how we interact in that, what you call season of winter or season of darkness. Yeah. So beautiful. So beautiful. I know that you have a free gift on your website that has the sound healing in it. Am I right? Yes. Yes. It's called Awakened Woman. And 
it's a it's a sound healing and guided med. In fact, I share, funnily enough, I share the I am home invocation there. And my intention in sharing that um, with with anybody who feels called to work with the experience of really in your bones coming home to yourself. Here, here's what I'll say. The I am home invocation, the intention of it is to support women or anyone, you know, men, women, children in having the experience of coming home to themselves at feeling so safe and welcome in their bodies, in their beings, in this moment, just as you are, by the way, right? Not, not in this perfect, you know, idea that we may have about, again, who we should be, but right here, just as you are, that the more we can be in the vibration, and I mean that quite literally, um, the, what's so powerful about this work with sound, if we think about music, um, it is, it has been used in a sacred way in a healing way, uh, throughout all of history and, and the vibration, um, of the, of the chakra bowls in combination with, uh, you know, the, the intention that I hold with the music and the mantras that I share, um, with my voice is that vibration penetrates, right? Vibration mm moves water and yeah. our bodies are made up of a lot of water <laughs> and so it brings us uh, quite literally into this vibration of of being at home within ourselves and my belief is that when we do the work of coming home to ourselves day after day after day that the the possibilities that open up for us. And and in regard to things like feeling free for me to actually use my voice, right? (laughs) Right. Um, And feeling uh, safe. And feeling safe, right? We really need, if, if safety is not there, it's hard to move forward with, with our callings. It's hard to move forward with our, you know, our voices in any way. And so that is the intention that I hold with that. And so anybody that, um, would like to use that as a part of their daily practice, uh, you can find that at the nourishedhome.com forward slash gift. Oh, I can't wait to go. I'm going to go listen as soon as we're okay. done. <laughs> and also I'll put that link in the show notes page at kellycovert.com. So if you can remember one or the other, you're good to go. Okay. <laughs> um, so you guys can all go right over there and download it and check it out and learn more about Laura. So, Laura, this has been such an amazing 45 minutes. I just want to honor and acknowledge you and the power that you are carrying through listening to your inner voice. And I'm so grateful that we have women like you who are willing to share your story so we can learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so, so beautiful that you are holding this platform with multiple women and voices coming together to talk about this process because there's so much that's universal about just how desperately we need to be back in connection with our inner voices. And there's so much beautiful variety and richness in the way that each of us comes back to that. So I know that what you're doing is letting so many women know that, you know, they aren't alone, as you said before. And I'm sure that this is inspiring so many people people to, to be at home with themselves. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And to learn more about what Laura's up to, you can check out her website at the And where can we find you on the socials? Yes. So, um, on Instagram, it's under Laura Thompson Brady. And, uh, I do have a page for the nourished home on Facebook. And I also have a personal page where I share stuff there as well. And, Yeah, that's where you can find me. Great. And we'll put links to all of that fun stuff too over on the show notes page. Laura, thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing your voice more and more. And hopefully we can connect soon. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Kelly. I hope you guys loved that interview. It filled my heart with so much joy to connect with Laura and to talk about how she truly found her voice inside and out. It's such a cool story. So I really hope that you'll take the time to go download her gift so you can hear her singing and doing her sound healing. And you can have access to all of that information 
right on my website, kellycover.com. Just click on the podcast tab and you will see all of the episodes there. And so this is episode number two with Laura Brady Thompson. And I want to thank all of you for being here, for listening today. I just want to acknowledge you and let you know that you, each and every one of you are worthy right in this moment. And thank you, thank you for being here. And also, thank you for subscribing on iTunes. We had an amazing launch day, Friday, May 12th. So thank you to all of you who have subscribed already. And if you haven't subscribed, make sure you head on over to iTunes. The link is on the show notes page, or you can just search In Her Voice. It will be the first podcast that comes up. Click on it, subscribe, download all the episodes, and If you're feeling really motivated, leave a rating. I would really appreciate that. So we will be talking soon and always know that you matter. Your voice matters. Mm -hmm.